right, um, if you let us. So I think let's get started. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, this is being recorded just to let you all know, but yeah, this is just going to be a quick debrief on the um, March 2023 GAMSAT results. And I don't know, I feel like looking at the participants, uh, I think everyone here knows me. Um, if not, just a quick intro. I'm Megna, one of the Section 1 managers, and I do a little bit of everything <laughs> everywhere all at once. Um, so you might have interacted with me on multiple different sort of like areas of phrases. So yeah, just wanted to send you all a warm welcome and I hope we're all doing well. And I'll leave the others to introduce themselves. <clears throat> Rahman, go for it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, normally when you say leave the others, I was like, oh, you know, sometimes someone will jump in and then you just start interrupting each other. So I was hoping for you to be like, Number one, oh. number two. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. Number one, Rahman, let's go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so my name is uh, Abdurrahman, um, but a lot of my mates call me Rahman. Uh, um, in terms of who I am, goodness, well, the introductions are so hard. Why are they so hard? Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, I'm a second year medical student at the University of Melbourne. I started medical school in 2021, so no gap years, um, and got into medical straight out of biomed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, GAMSAT. So what do I do at Phrases? I am the Section 3 lead for um, for biology. So a lot of the bio stuff, the bio content and whatnot, that's, I'm responsible for making that. I'm responsible for curating the content there and for making the questions for biology as well. So that's what I do at Phrases. Um, in terms of GAMSAT history, well, you know, I'm one of those weirdos that sat the GAMSAT just the one time and did really well. So yeah, then I started teaching at phrases directly after I got my score, thought I'd make a little bit of extra money to help with the payments because life is expensive. <laughs> um, but yeah, that pretty much sums up me. Um, what about you? Uh, let's go with Alex. Thank you for that, Raman. Um, so I'm Alex. I am also a medical student. I'm at the University of Melbourne. I'm in my third year. And I am an S1 tutor and also mentor. And I've been with phrases for a few years now. And so I guess that's just to say, guys, that I know if some of you are a little bit more disappointed with your results, I know exactly what you may be feeling. I was once in your shoes. I sat the games at three times. First two times were definitely not very good. Did the course at a third time, did well. Um, yeah, so that is me. I will hand over to Kieran now. Cool. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Kieran. Um, I am a first year medical student at the University of Queensland. Um, thank you, Rahman. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, also a tutor here in S1 and S3. I'm really excited to chat to you all. Um, oh, oh, wow, this is the kind of tone we're setting, huh, Megna? Okay. Um, no, yeah, really excited to be here today to talk about like, you know, the GAM set and stuff like that, have a bit of a debrief. Um, I am kind of like Alex as well. Um, I'm a bit of a veteran of the game. I set the GAM set four times, been through the highs, been through the lows, um, you know, applied for three years before I got in. So, you know, kind of been through through it all. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, you know, looking forward to today to celebrate with those of you that are excited and looking forward. Um, but at the same time, you know, maybe strategize for those of you for whom maybe when did they drop Thursday wasn't that good a day. Um, also, by the way, maybe before we even start, like Acer dropping scores at 11 p.m. Like, can we talk about this for a moment? Like, absolutely diabolical. Did he message me at like 11 when they dropped? He's like, the scores drop. And me being the idiot that I was, checked my email like I sat <laughs> I opened my Gmail and I'm like, why? And he's like, Megna, you didn't sit it. <laughs> but yeah, I just feel like they're really out to ruin everyone's weekends. I don't know. They, they jump on 11 p.m. And it's like, honestly, some people are going to sleep. They're really about to be ruining people's sleeps and coming in their nightmares as well. Really? Yeah. Really? Last year was on the weekend, right? It was like Friday night or something. Mm. I, I don't remember. Um. Yeah, it might have been actually like that. But yeah, um, so I just, I guess, as you know, somebody that didn't have to go through that, I just want to say I'm so sorry, because that sounds like the best way to just absolutely ruin your night. Um, or maybe like, you know, maybe if it went well, that's fantastic. But I still feel like either way, it would have ruined your sleep. 
So, you know, drop it at seven, Acer. Um, but anyway, I guess it, it is what it is. I just wanted to throw that out there because I just feel like I haven't had a chance to like talk to anyone about it. And even though I haven't, I didn't like, this doesn't really impact me. Like at the same time, like, you know, I'm not waiting for results at the same time. It's still like, it shook me. So I just had to share. Yeah. I feel like every season when students, you know, especially being a tutor, um, when students go through this process and then they get their results, I feel like it brings me back every single time to when I got my results and when people are getting, and every single time it's the same. I'm, I'm like, and I feel so much for you guys who maybe worked so hard and still didn't really get the scores that you'd like, because that was once, that was once me. That was once yeah. us. So definitely, definitely. we know what it's like. It's so funny you say that, Alex, because like legit, I was the same. Like when I heard they dropped, I like jumped on Reddit and I started like like reading Reddit streams and, and I'm like, why? And it was 11 p.m. Like I had school the next day at eight in the morning and my partner's next to me like, what are you doing? Like go to bed. I'm like, babe, I can't. Scores just dropped. Like, what do you mean? She's like, it, like, because you're so right, Alex. It just like fully brings it back. I wonder how long it's going to be. I reckon this is going to be like a lifelong thing. Like, it's you know, a lifelong thing. It really is. And like my friends who I study with me in third year, they're like, oh, yeah, oh, you tutor for the Gamzat. Oh, yeah, well, it must be nice to kind of get be over it now. We're three years into the med degree, and I haven't thought about Gamzat in three years. And I'm like, well, actually, I think about it twice a year ever yes. since my Gamzat. So, yes, I guess Bro. the big idea behind that is that we feel like if, if any of you are very excited and happy about your scores, we feel it. But at the same time, if, if you, if some of you are disappointed, we feel it as well. So um, you're not alone in that because we all care. We all wanted you guys to do very, very well, but the gamzet is difficult. It's really, really hard. It's not your typical exam. Multiple factors could go wrong. So we, we understand. Yeah, definitely. And I, I just feel like, yeah, in the most honest way possible, Gamsat sucks, bro. Yeah, like, it's, like even if you did amazing, I feel like it. It sucks. It's not. A, it's. I don't think it's the. It's not a good process, is it? I. I really don't think it captures a lot of what you need to be a yeah. doctor or a dentist or an optometrist. I feel like it's. Yeah. It's kind of the best of the worst system. Like, there's definitely worse ways to go about it, but this is just what Australia has settled on. But um, we'll get into more of that later. Let's. Uh, in terms of what's going to happen tonight. The first thing, <clears throat> as usual, sorry, <clears throat> don't know why I just have a frog in my throat all of a sudden, but, you know, let's go through the score analysis, right? So let's look at the percentile curves, um, the differences between the March 2023 GAMSAT and the previous GAMSATs or the previous March ones. Uh, talk a little bit about applications and interviews and for some of you, um, resetting the GAMSAT as well. So again, just kind of want to say, ask as many questions about these processes as you can, because, you know, either way, you want to get both of them uh, sort of as right as possible. Like if you're applying to a, you know, a med school, you want to get an interview, make sure that you apply and give all the right information, et cetera, and you prepare. Uh, if you are resitting the GAM side as well, first things first, please, like we're on your side. I think Three out of the four people you see in front of you right now in med school and in dentistry, we I've said the games out like four or five times, right? So like we we completely know what it's like to open that scorecard and just have like crushing disappointment and just be like, great, another six months of my life for this test, right? So you, we've we've all been there. Definitely commiserate with you. But at the same time, we can, you know, talk to you a little bit more about um, how to level up that score. And just in general, if you just want to talk or vent or ask questions as well. And at the end, we can answer some general Q&As depending um, on either of those topics as well. Cool. I think we already have a QA. and a um, What if you got a score less than 50 for Section 1? So any score um, less than 50 for any section kind of means, uh, you, you know, you kind of failed that section, right? So 50 is the minimum you need to get across every section of the GAMSAT. I don't know if this part is wrong, so please correct me, uh, other panelists, but if you have less than 50, does it mean it's an invalid score? Most, for most universities, yes. Most yeah. universities will require you to have a minimum of 50 in each section to apply. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, it means it means you're likely invalid. That being said, there are some caveats to it. If you're say rural, for example, sometimes there's different um, different rules to it. But for most universities, for most applicants, unfortunately, yeah. yes, getting less than fifty in a section means it's not a valid GAMSAT, um, irrespective of how well you did in the other sections. Yeah. Um, right. So that's that question. But yeah, just kind of wanted to ask everyone. I know a few people uh, in, in the participant list I've already sort of like talked to and reached out to and things like that. But um, yeah, how is everyone feeling? Are we feeling good? Are we feeling bad? Somewhere in between? Don't really know what we're feeling. I'll also say like, this is, you know, a pretty, a pretty safe space in terms of like, you know, if you feel like it didn't go so well and stuff like that, you know, I think hopefully, you know, at least one of the tutors here on this panel and you'll know that, you know, there's no, no shame in it, maybe not going so well, you know, that's, that's part of the process. So yeah, hopefully you can use this, um, this forum as an opportunity to even just vent those frustrations. You know, I know that a lot of people go through this medical journey kind of alone, you know, like not having other friends going through it or whatever it may be. And therefore it's difficult to, yeah, express those emotions to people that understand it. So, you know, obviously do whatever you want, but I guess I just want to reiterate that, you know, literally most of us <laughs> here know what it's like to be disappointed afterwards. So don't feel like you have to yeah, yeah. say like, oh yeah, you know, I'm happier or, or just stay silent. And there's no judgment either, um, just because we've, I think that's really important, regardless of, you know, how many times uh, we've done the test or not done the test or where we're applying, not applying, like, no one here is really here to judge, like, none of us have the right to do that. And none of us are those people anyway. So um, please don't hesitate to respond. And please don't think that we're going to judge you in any way, shape or form. Like, yeah, definitely not. Um, yeah, so a few people feeling uncertain, not as good as expected. Uh, you know, there's, there's a general feeling that, you know, it could have gone a little bit better. And to be honest with you all, I don't know, um, just from the students I've sort of reached out to, it it was a difficult gamsat. I've, even on the day as well, um, and please, like, Kieran, Alex, Raman, like, feel free to... Um, agree, disagree, add your thoughts to this. But even on the day, I had so many messages like, what the hell was section three? What the hell was section one? Or section two itself was some people found it to be weird as well. Like that day was really kind of very mixed bag. So I'm not surprised that the results are a bit of a mixed bag as well. Like I've had some students do really well, but some students do really badly. They weren't expecting it. So yeah, I've, I'm kind of in that, like I'm weirded out by it as well. Well, I, I, even on the day, I remember that afterwards, um, a lot of my students, like my mentees were writing and they were saying things like, well, I found that the, um, you know, I was okay with section two, I was okay with section three, but I found that there was lots of long texts in section one, which kind of threw me off, which, you know, I think it's something that's important to reflect on as well if that's the case if that's the trend and we actually did notice that, that was the trend in September too like comparatively speaking there were more technical texts yeah um, I suppose maybe now there are even more so I think it's kind of worthwhile thinking okay if that's the trend let's go with the trend for September I'm going to be doing more technical texts and you know I think yeah reflecting on it is very important and generally usually after the exams that I do get a lot of students who, whether they end up doing well or not, they say, you know what, that was difficult, but I think I did okay. But this time around, I did find a lot of you guys were actually leaving it, being either confused, like unsure of if you did well, or just completely like that was really hard. So yeah. if you are feeling that way and the results reflect that too, just know you are not the only one. Mm. I feel like Ace are really overcorrected with the long text. Like I re I predicted it when Inda and I had a bet. Um, like there would be a lot of technicals, right? But neither of us expected sort of like the amount of it. I remember last year it was very fictional heavy, cartoon heavy, poem heavy. This time around, I had students come out of the games that like we didn't get a poem. It was all technical. It was all creative or it was a cartoon. So I feel like Ace have really overcorrected that 
like long text sort of thing. Sorry, Rahman, you were about to say something. Oh, no, no, I was just going to talk about section three because, you yeah, know, um, you, I feel like there's a lot of representation of section one here. But <laughs> I've had, um, yeah, a couple of students reach out and they were like, you know, section three was wild, right? Um, it was like really, they, they felt as if it was very left of field. They didn't really feel like they knew what they were doing. Um, and it mixed back. So one of, one of my students that would just, was like, hey, I don't think I'm going to even pass section three, ended up getting pretty good for section three, got a 70 plus. And then another student that thought, you know, I think I did relatively decently for section three, ended up doing pretty badly. So, you know, again, a bit of a mixed bag overall. Uh, I feel like, and that's just the GAMSAT. It's the nature of the GAMSAT. They just throw stuff and just, you know, they they, they, they change things as much as, you know, uh, it's, it's just always flipping. So sometimes there's heavy math, sometimes there's heavy graphs, sometimes it's, it's it just... There's so much that can go on and there's so much that they can change and they often do that. So I guess, and we'll talk a little bit about how to then structure your preparation going forward, but often it's to ensure that you've got a good baseline in everything so that if they throw something at you that's left of field, you at least have those kind of fundamental skills to fall back on to do well. So, you know, gone are the days where you can be like, right, I'm just going to focus on graphs and I'll be able to ace all the graphs questions and do well, right? Unfortunately, the way the game that's kind of heading is you can't do that anymore. You need to have, especially for section three, a good baseline across everything because they will throw stuff at you, especially math. Recently, they've just loved their mathematics. They've, I was just going to ask <laughs> yeah, they've so so Lachlan in the chat's absolutely right. They just everything is to do with mathematics now. So that's really hindering a lot of the uh the typical biomed students that are a bit averse to math. And what I've also found is so myself included, I'm very like math heavy. I like math. Math is fun. Um so you know, when it comes to mathematics in general, I think going forward you kind of have to up those math skills to do to do well in section three. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, definitely heard, like I was just about to ask, what, what was your thoughts on everyone saying that there was so much maths, it was like a maths exam this time around, um, but yeah, it was it's kind yeah. of annoying. Yeah, to, just, to, to quote my methods teacher, uh, maths is the purest way to assess logical reasoning. Um, his wording. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's very much, oh, if A, then B, B, then C, this follows this. That's very, like, math-based. Um, so I think given that it's such a good way to assess logic, they they tend to use it a lot more now as compared to inductive reasoning where people can argue, well, I can argue that this isn't correct because it's words. Um, hashtag section one. <laughs> but, yeah. So... <laughs> I will pick you off the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Um, but, yeah, that, <laughs> that's, yeah that's, that's what I have to say about section three. Um. We have a Q&A. Does Fraser's compile the types of questions from the actual exam and send these to students so that we can reflect on those before the next sitting? So ASA does not release any ounce of data in any way, shape or form, nor do they release how they calculate uh, the scores to what I think. I think all we know is like how many points they calculated to, like four decimal points or something. So um, no one can get that data uh, ever. I, I think they're even exempt from like freedom of information acts, right? Like that's how heavily protected um, ACER is. So no, we can't get that. What we do is obviously people tell us like, hey, you know, this text came up in the GAMSAT, this book came up and uh, we write questions based on that. So we do have uh, questions and stems that have come up in previous mocks and pre sorry, in previous GAMSATs in our mock exams, in our question banks and things like that. So we write questions based on what we hear, but no one will ever really get that data. It won't happen. Um, so yeah, I think we should be careful with questions like that as well. Um, cool. Uh, I mean, the types questions as in technical poetry, Again, it's such a broad range of student feedback that we can't properly compile it. And not every student really does like talk to us after as well, right? Regardless of whether do well or badly. So yeah, it's just, it's it's a little bit difficult for us to be able to do that. Um, all right, next Q&A, Kieran. Uh, sorry? Do you know more about this, sorry? Like the curve yeah. shifting left. Should I just move on to the next slide? I think. Um yeah, let's maybe move to the left side. But yeah, I, I can speak to this. So with the curve shifting to the left, does that put M23 sitters at a disadvantage since you need only look at roll scores? So this is something that continually comes up, right? Like every every time that the GAMSAT is sat, the curve shifts. And this is due to a variety of reasons. And, you know, uh, what, what often happens is people go, 
oh, the, the test is easier or harder this year, whatever it may be. Now, now, that could definitely be argued, you know, that that's fine. But honestly, this is just normal variability. Like these are very well thought out tests. There's, you know, very rigorous method to, you know, methods to it. Um, and therefore, you know, to say, oh, this is a harder test or this is an easier test is, is probably incorrect, right? Um, now, to say, you know, that somebody's disadvantaged in a particular test because the curve shifts isn't really quite correct for the very reason that you brought up, because unis don't care about your percentile score, all right? So this is something to keep in mind with all of you, for all of you that are planning on applying, the universities literally only care about your raw score. They do not care about how that corresponds to a particular percentile, all right? Why? Because the raw scores are meant to be transferable from year to year, especially now that we have a four-year um, validity of scores, those scores need to be valid across, thus the percentile curve is kind of irrespective or kind of irrelevant, at least in the university's eyes. So to answer your question directly, not really, because again, it doesn't matter where the what the percentile is. Now you could make the argument, well, the percentile reflects that this is a harder exam or whatever it may be. Perhaps, perhaps not. Unfortunately, however, the universities don't take any of this into account. They really just care about your score. Um, hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, but maybe I can kind of start speaking to it here. You know, so yeah, we have an overall score of 59, and then we have um, you know, the top 10 percentile being around 70. Now, I will say that this is a slight variation from the year before, but honestly, this is almost like kind of what we've been seeing, you know, like this is still relatively, you know, still still in the ballpark. You know, it's not like, oh, well, whoa, now the, the you know, top 10 percentile is actually a 60 or something like that. Like 70 tends to be that magic number where you're in the top 10 percentile. And that has been the case for the last, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, two years or something like that, maybe like post COVID, um, it's changed to that point. And I mean, here we have a bit of a statement saying like, yeah, scores have actually kind of gone up if anything. So you could argue, I don't know, that you're slightly better advantage or whatever it may be, right? So anyway, um, that's kind of my, my two cents there. Um, anybody else want to throw something out? Yeah, Raman, go for it. Yeah, just wanted to re reiterate that point of the scores being comparable between sits. So the percentile is essentially just the percentage of people that got that score or above in that particular sit. So you, in some sits, you might have a person who, or, or a group of individuals, or like, let's say like that, that seat in general, were just like really, really good at the game set. And they all got scores above 70. It, that would never happen. But theoretically speaking, that would mean that 70 would be the 50th percentile. But each of those individuals deserves to get a 70. So they got one, right? So it's standardized across the, across the cohorts. Um, that is that a 70 in a previous sit would be comparable to a 70 in, a, in another sit, regardless of what the percentiles are. What it does mean, however, it, is that if there is a shift towards the scores being higher, it can make the um, it can make things a little bit more competitive for the universities. That is that there's more people applying with the particular score. Let's say 70, 70 was the 50th percentile. That'll completely change everything out of whack. Um, but, uh, but you know, that will never happen, right? Because the way that ASA is, they're, they're very meticulous with their questions. The questions themselves, if anything, are getting more difficult than less difficult. So um, getting into a situation where 70 is the 50th percentile would like not happen at all, really. So because the and as as Kieran kind of mentioned with regards to the, the tiny percentage differences, um, given that sixty seventh percentile was the ninetieth was was in the ninetieth percentile, sixty seventh sorry was in, in the ninetieth percentile and now seventy, um, because it's a plus three in the grand scheme of applications, it doesn't really change anything, right? If however there was a drastic change where seventy was now a fiftieth percentile, right? That's now a big deal. Yeah, but in these kind of small minute variations, and we're going to see a, a, a graph in the next few slides that kind of compares across the four sits and right, right here. Well, there you go. Notice how the variation is, you know, 2018, 2019, and then, um, you know, with the, with the more consistent after the online shift, all of those scores have been relatively consistent. There has been a slight flattening of the curve, but nothing 
uh, drastic. So maybe a maximum percentile difference of maybe let's say five to seven percentiles, which isn't that big in the grand scheme of things. But yeah. Yeah, Those I think as well with, with sort of these, I think more than sort of looking into them, they kind of indicate the next phase of analytics, if anything, because up until you get the GAMSAT, you get the GAMSAT, right? But then after you get your score and you're applying, um, it then becomes a matter of like GPA as well. So I think these percent percentile curves kind of, I, I feel like their usefulness stops at the scorecard, right? Um, whereas this, then it's a different percentile curve for the universities when they measure your GPA and your GAMSAT combined, then your GPA, GAMSAT and your interview combined and all those sorts of things. So yeah, I feel like the score is kind of what we really need to uh, walk away with, if anything. Cool. Anything else we need to add on the scores or any questions at all? But yeah, like I'm not even gonna attempt to explain it as well as Roman did because look, I'll take it. I'm a section one tutor after all. Maths is um, it's good, but it's not amazing. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's how I would characterize myself. But yeah, I think the scores have kind of improved. Uh, they've kind of corrected back a little bit. Um, and yeah, so I feel like the pool of applicant data will be a little bit stronger, if anything. But then again, you just never know with GPAs as well, right? The GPAs could undercorrect and you could have weaker GPAs, stronger GAMSAT or vice versa. So I don't know. It's just, yeah, here and go. Uh, yeah. Maybe. And then, oh, sorry. Go. Sorry, Rahman. Uh, no, go, go uh, I was going to yeah, just mention the one point. It's like, of course, you've got the GPA in the interview, which you might expect have some correlation with the GAMSAT, but then the interview throws everything out of whack, right? Um, because, you know, you have your stereotypes. If you wanted to block people in stereotypes, I know that we shouldn't do this, but in medicine, we tend to, um, you know. Maybe archetype so, is a better word. Archetype. Archetypes are probably yeah. a better word. Let's say archetypes. Stereotypes doesn't sound actually right. But yeah, you know, let's say your typical kind of a student who's just really, really good at studying and spends 10 to 15 hours a day studying and doesn't know how to speak necessarily to a lot of people, right, might have like 100 GAMS at, a, you know, 7 out of 7 GPA, but then come the interviews, they, they're not as verbose as, you know, one would expect a medical professional to be. Um, then you have, you know, individuals that might have a really good um, kind of social experience and maybe not necessarily the greatest scores because they didn't spend as much time on those things, but have, you know, a fantastic way of conveying the information that they want to convey, especially in, within an interview format, who'd end up being about the same as that individual with the 7 and the 100, right? So it, it, because of that, when you add in the GPA and the, and the uh, interview, the GAMSAT is not as use as useful as a marker to indicate who's going to be uh, someone who gets accepted into medical school and and dental school and beyond. Yeah, definitely. Um, maybe if I may, right? Because the the last thing that I'll throw out is, um, at this point, especially when we're going through medical school applications, we are hyper fixated. Um, and I say we because this is something that I kind of definitely went through as well. We're hyper fixated with thinking about the competition. And we go, oh, is this an easier cohort? You know, is this a harder cohort? You know, uh, like even just now we're saying, oh, there's overcorrection, undercorrection. You know, if anything, scores are a little bit higher. Please don't worry. You know, like it's very, very easy to sit here and go, oh, damn, like everything's stacked against me and it's just going to be impossible. It's going to be impossible. Every year it's like this. Every single year, you know, things get a little bit harder and, you know, it's a little bit tougher. And every single year people get in. You know, so I, I just want to really make that clear because it's really easy in the space of anxiety and stress to be very uncertain to the point of almost just kind of being just catastrophizing all the time. And that can take a really big impact, you know, or can have a really big impact on you. So the honest reality is things haven't changed that much. Like things are still pretty much the same. Like you still need a good GPA. You still need a good GAMSAT, but you're, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, now only one person in Australia is going to get into medical school. There are still those spots there. And for those of you that have got those competitive scores or maybe even sitting on the edge, you still have that shot. You know, so just don't don't, don't worry too, too much is what I would say about, especially when it comes to thinking about stuff like this, like percentile curves and, oh, is this year a bit, a bit more competitive or so on? Like you've done your stuff and now just go through the process. I mean, you just have to remember that, you know, as Kieran said, 
someone's going to have to get into medical school. It's the, you know, these people say oh, it's impossible to get into medical school. Well, that's a fallacy logically because there are medical spots every year. And if, we, if no one got into med medical school a particular year, we would have a crisis on our hands for that generation who won't have enough doctors, right? So like people have to get into medical school. So it's not like, oh, you know, no one's going to get into medical school. It's more, are things a little bit competitive? How's the cohort going and all these things? But just remember that it's not impossible to get in. People, someone has to get in. Somebody has to, right? So, and, and you know, there's no shot to say, oh, I won't be one of those people, either now or in the future, right? Never, ever tell yourself that, oh, I can't do it because my score is so low now, right? You have so many people improving from low scores to high scores. Um, so, so many people. And that, honestly, that's kind of the general trend as well. Um, that, you know, you sit together so you don't get the best score the first time because you really didn't know what you were doing unless you had like really good mentorship and really good like um, you spoke to a lot of people who sat the game set and you got all of their advice and you kind of collated it together to make your own thing unless you did that often the general trend is to sit the game set first time sit at second sit at third sit at fourth etc i think the average number was like 4.5 sits or something like that i can't remember where i was reading that but I think it's the, two in, point. yeah it's like almost three sits basically yeah so, somewhere about three sits right yeah so so that's you know it's it's very very common to sit the game set multiple times um you know don't stress about not getting a good score the first time remember your scores are eligible for four years so technically speaking that's eight gam sets you have you just have to crack it in one right you crack it in one and then that's eligible for four years so that gives you time to you know maybe up your gpa if you needed to it gives you a lot it gives you a lot of freedom right mm -hmm. so yeah i was just um, saying oh sorry no 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 go for it Meg, now. um i'll just say two things right um one thing just to go off of what raman and kieran have said um, something another tutor said to me ages back was uh, everyone who really wants to get into med will get in at some point, right? Why not you and why not this time around? And I think I was saying that to Kieran when he was really nervous about applying as well. Like we were chatting randomly after like an S1 class. And I remember Kieran and I having this conversation. So yeah, it might not be your year this year, this GAMSAT, right? But why can't it be you next year? And going off of that, my second point is you don't need to do as well as you think you do to get in. You don't need a 70. You don't need a 75. You don't need an 80 right? You can get mid 60s, have a 6.5 to 6.7 GPA, um, you know, and get an interview offer and absolutely kill it, right? So anyone who's in the chat who's like, oh, you know, I didn't do well at all. Yep. And that's okay. This is not your shot this time around. It could be better. But also, please don't think that it's only valid or your score or your effort will only be valid if you get a 70, like that's not the only payoff point. I know people who got in with like a 66. Super, right? super, super valid point for sure. Yeah. The only time that we really kind of say, um, you, you know, if, if anybody ever gives you like a ballpark figure as in like, for instance, someone might say, oh, you know, I think a 70 is a good score. That's only to, if you want to be a hundred percent certain you have a, you, you get an interview. Most of the time, you don't need the 70. No. And I had a lot of tutors tell me that. They're like, oh, get a 70. And like, you know, that's what everyone should aim for. Everyone should get a 70. And, you know, I used to beat myself up. But Alex, you made a really good point. Like, the only reason they were telling me that is because, you know, they were like, hey, this will probably give you a much better chance. That's all. And it's like, hard it's because it's hard to answer questions. I know we we all yeah. want to know what's the ballpark, you know, what what do I need to get in? But the answer is really depends on the cohort. And, you know, it's any man's game. And I think just based off of what you guys were saying previously, ever since, you know, I was in, I was trying to get in, I would always tell myself, it's not about if, it's about the when. Mm. It's about if it's not about, you know, what um, you know, if I this and this, it's about if I get into medicine, I'll do this start using when I get into medicine vocab uh, um, language. Don't be like, well, if one day I get a good score, I might get into medicine. Or if I get into medicine one day, start saying when I get in, when I get into medicine. And remember that as annoying as it might sound now, um, exactly, manifest it. And as annoying as it might sound now, if you maybe didn't do as well as you would have liked, I still would like to congratulate you on persevering and I'd like to congratulate you on being one gamzat sitting closer to finally getting in one day. So that's a good way of looking at it too. You're one gamzat sitting down until you get the score that you need. Definitely. I mean, 
Mm. You know, I can just speak from my experience as somebody that went through three application cycles. Like, absolutely. It's just a matter of perseverance. Um, maybe, however, like if I may, because I see one of the questions is here, like what sort of score would you say would be worth applying with, right? So I know it's an annoying answer to hear, but genuinely, it honestly depends because, every, you know, what, what Rockman and, and Megna and Alex have said is absolutely true. When it comes to applications, it's not very clear cut. It's not just a matter of, you know, your GPA, your campsite, and that's it. There's variations across all of them. There's variations in how, you know, universities look at your GAMSAT. For example, you might have gotten a GAMSAT score that says, I don't know, you got a 60 or something like that. But are you aware of the fact that some universities take your unweighted GAMSAT score? And therefore, if S3 is what's bringing you down, maybe you actually have a stronger score. Do you know that, you know, a lot of universities have different ways of calculating GPA and therefore maybe your GPA actually looks stronger than what it should be? Maybe you're eligible for a bonus. Like there's so many bonuses running around. Like Deacon, if you're based in Melbourne, gives you bonuses for being on Centrelink, for having worked full time, for being a past Deacon student, you know, for having worked in healthcare. If you're rural, that changes everything. If you've done honors, if you've done a PhD, if you've done a master's, like different universities will give you bonuses for so many different things. Therefore, you can definitely get in with slightly lower scores, like, you know, lower quote unquote, let me give you more because I I'm part of the like student support team and I talk to people about applications all the time. So I can tell you this, you know, from having had these conversations on top of that, you have universities like, say, for example, Wollongong and Notre Dame, where it's not just your score that determines it. Wollongong, you have a portfolio. Notre Dame this year is looking at your Casper. Like if you're feeling like, oh, I'm not too sure how my results went. Let me tell you this. This year. Notre Dame is counting the Casper equally to the GAMSAT and equal to your GPA. Like it's like a 30, 30, 30 split. Like, so now fantastic. Maybe you, you kind of fumbled it when it came to the GAMSAT and that's just what it is. But now you have another opportunity. If you do really well in the Casper, congratulations. You compensated for a slightly lower GAMSAT score. So like you've got all of these options here available to you, you yeah. know, so to, to give you the direct answer, like what score do I need? There, there isn't one because it really depends. But also to kind of further expand on it, because again, like it is crazy, Alex, you know, you're talking about like, yeah, having all those feelings about the camp set, like all of this is making me go back to last year, you know, feeling all of this again. Like I remember going onto Reddit and going onto things and looking at other people's scores and going like, and excuse the language, but holy shit, somebody got, you know, a 78 and they got rejected and stuff like that. Bro, there's, I, I swear, like, you don't know what happened in those situations, you know? Like, don't let the data that you see online dissuade you. Like, I think I saw a question here going, you know, if we looked at previous year scores, is that a good enough thing to kind of determine where the cutoff is and stuff like that? Like, sure, I guess it's kind of an indication maybe, but at the same time, you shouldn't use it as gospel, you know, because you, you genuinely never know. If it's an option, this is the advice I always give. Like, so long as you've passed um, every section, as in your score is valid and you've got, a, you know, a valid GPA, throw your hat in the ring. Like, worst thing that they can say is no, and then, okay, your suspicions are confirmed. But I feel like the worst thing that could possibly happen is you don't apply, and then you hear from somebody else or you see some random comment on Reddit go, oh, I got in with this score. And you're like, oh, oh, that's exactly what I had, you know, or something along those lines. Like, don't let that happen. Don't listen to all the stuff that you read online. It isn't that grim. It isn't like, you know, the one in a million that gets in. Like, it's, it's a bit more common than that. Sorry, a bit of a rant, but- No, no, no. I think it kind of consolidates what we've all been saying, right? Like- all the people who got in these, like most people who get in guys are the people with the mid sixties, low six, like mid sixties, let's say like 64 to 67, 66, right? Those are most people in medical and dental cohorts, right? So that should kind of tell you everything in and of itself. There'll always be people who do drastically better and amazing, good for them. They deserve to be there as well. But most people, like, they will get the average level score 
and they will do well in their GPA and they will practice for their interview and do well and whatever else they need to do, like portfolios, personal statements, et cetera, and they'll get it in. So please um, don't think that, you know, all these different numbers play a role, right? Like no matter how much of your life you spend going through Reddit data and getting AI to analyze it and all that sort of stuff, uh, at the end of the day, it's it's really going to be nothing but a time waster for you. That's, yeah. So don't overthink the numbers. You just apply. Definitely. And can I just say, Megan, can I just say, um, <laughs> when it comes to like analyzing data and all that stuff, I can guarantee you that, no matter how much you analyze the data, you're often going to be, actually, most of the time you're going to be wrong because Acer is very, very protective of their systems. It's protective of their accounting, their scoring. You have no idea what the distribution of your scores was. For instance, if you got, I don't know, if you got a 70 in section three, you have no idea how that was calculated. Mm -hmm. So try not to play the numbers game. Don't try to outsmart the system. It is what it is let it go and focus on the next scams at. Furthermore, as a general life, here's my big sister advice. Stay away from Reddit. And paging doctor. And paging doctor. And generally stay away from people. Take every single thing with a grain of salt. Stay away from that. Do not go on there. Why? Because people will try to demoralize you. People will try and you know, write stuff that's not true just to make themselves feel better. Exactly, Lachlan, just stay away from people. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's true. Like, as you know, the boys mentioned, um, when you go online, when you go onto those, you know, resources and you see people being like, my 78 Gamzat and my 7.0 GPA didn't get me an interview. I can guarantee you that person is there's something that's missing either their gamzet was not as high or their gpa was not as high or both of them are not as high and people are going to try to make you feel scared and demoralized so as a general rule of thumb stay away from reddit stay away from paging doctor and don't try and do the maths it is what it is let it go move on think about the next one generally 100%. just stay away from those websites 100 percent. if I, I just something else right because I remember listening to this exact advice and going like, yeah, but I'm still going to look at it though. <laughs> um, like I will say when it comes to like the reports that we read on Reddit and stuff like that, there's so much bias in it, bro. Like the, the majority, firstly, if you look at Reddit data, like you're, you'd honestly believe that an 80 is like pretty common when in reality, a handful of people get an 80. And yet, you know, there it, it represents 10% of scores, okay? So you've got to understand that there's a very real situation where the people that did well like to flex it. For example, Rahman doesn't stop talking about how he got a 97 in S3. But everybody else, the normal individual, no, I'm, I've got to correct that. Rahman's such a nice guy. I feel so bad, like, even making jokes like that because it's so not true. But anyway. I was, I, was about, I was about to say, like, what the heck, bro? Yeah, bro, I've, <laughs> bro, I've never heard you say it once. I've never heard you say it once. But, bro, I, I don't know. It just, it came out of me. I don't know. I'm, I'm still bitter. Um, but, like, the reality is people that do well talk about how they did well. And the pe people that didn't do so well, like, don't, you know? So, therefore, like, you, you're just not going to see those scores come up as often. Like, the people that just kind of scratched in yeah kind of don't often voice it another thing to kind of say a lot of people in those gamsat communities and so on tend to be very dedicated they tend to be very involved so the cutoff scores that you see there are probably from people that have dedicated significant amounts of time now what that kind of means is we're not it's unlikely that we're seeing the lower end of individuals that get in all right and that's where that's that's, I suspect, you know, the universities don't tell us, right? But I suspect that that's actually a much bigger group of people than we really think it is. We think you've got to be that one in a million to get in with a average GAMSAT, average GPA and stuff like that. But they're definitely there. So again, the unis don't say anything. So if anybody's telling you, no, you need a minimum 70 and a minimum seven GPA, it's like you can fully just tell them to go away because that's like just not true. Like... Mm -hmm. You know, that that's like, yes, we can talk about chances and we've got to be realistic. Like if you're sitting here with like a five GPA 
and a 51 Gamsat, it's going to be hard to get in, right? But most of you are probably not sitting there and you're probably sitting in the middle. Like, yes, the honest fact is that if you had a higher score, it would probably be easier. But we don't care. Like, we're not, you know, thinking about the majority of people. We're thinking about just you. And therefore, you could be that one person that does get in. So forget about all the data. Just focus on yourself as an individual. You can still be that person. And can I just also add, just on the back of that, one of my friends who's studying medicine at the University of Sydney now, so um, his GPA, I, ca I can't remember, it wasn't as high as you would think for University of Sydney. And the University of Sydney, sorry, has a hurdle GPA, so it's only 5.0 that you need to meet. So after you get that, they don't care if you have, I know people in my cohort who have a 5.1 GPA. I also know people in my cohort who have a 6.9 GPA. Um, use it, it it does not matter as long as you clear the five that's why the gam sets are so you know kind of high and all over the place a little bit there's no interviews and stuff so use it is a that's another game all use, it, use it is something really interesting but um okay that's that's good the gpa doesn't really matter yeah his um yep no you i just gonna say his gamzat was a 67 right and you know for the for University of Sydney, that is on the lower end. For University of Sydney, it's a bit of an exception. They do tend to take, like Flinders University, they do tend to take gamsats in the 70s. So for instance, somebody with 71, um, my gamsat was 71 when I applied and I had a high GPA. They didn't accept me, even, even for, you know, they didn't accept me. So the only people who were getting accepted were those in the 70s. That being said, this time round, he was rejected from University of Sydney, but then very last minute, two weeks before the course began, he got an email saying, you've been accepted. So this just proves to you that no matter what happens, even if you feel like, oh gosh, you know, all my, you know, my, all hope is gone. Just try to retain that sliver of hope because you never know who's going to want to drop out, who's going to want to change universities and going to reject their offers. You have no idea. So please just bear in mind the story of my friend. So yeah, that's basically what I wanted to say. Yeah, you said does that a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, and also guys, something even more inspiration, just really quickly, we will move on to interviews and research and stuff, but a previous Fraser student here, <laughs> this was like the most catfish situation, got an offer the day before med started at UND, S, Notre Dame, Sydney, right? The day before. And the way they did it was they sent her a text saying, hey, this is Kerry from University of Notre Dame. <laughs> we have a place available in medicine. Would you like to take it? And she was like, this is an absolute scam. Like, this is a joke. And then she didn't reply. They called her the same day at 6 p.m. They're like, hey, like, this is really us. Will you be okay starting med? tomorrow or the day after because it was Saturday so they asked her to come into medical school on a Monday with not like they were like we'll, we'll take care of everything on the day just come in legit how the story went when Akif told me I was like this is um so it goes to show med schools don't really know what they're doing sometimes and that is also a scenario that could happen but yeah that's what Alex's story just reminded me of I was like if that was me I would have just not even picked up the call <laughs> yeah but let's move on to applications and interviews and, um, you know, kind of speed things up a little bit. So if you are thinking about applying uh, this year or this cycle, I guess, the first thing you want to assess is how strong is your application. Uh, the biggest mistake people make, in my opinion, is they don't think about or they don't read through the GEMSAS guide properly. Read through the GEMSAS guide with a fine tooth comb. Know where you have your best chances especially know what unis take unweighted GAMSAT scores and weighted GAMSAT scores, because that can be the difference of a few marks, either getting higher or getting lower, right? So calculate your GAMSAT score based on how the university sees it. I know University of Melbourne weighs all three sections equally, for example. So if you did really well in section three, your overall score might be a little bit lower um, at the University of Melbourne. It won't be like, crazy crazy to the point where you know it's it's like zero but it could be a little bit lower compared to other unis where it's a little bit higher because it's weighted uh twice um next thing as well 
and there's a lot to say about this, but we'll try and keep it concise. Start ordering your preferences to see what makes your GAMS app most competitive. With this caveat, GPA, okay? Um, this is one of those things where if you have a strong GAMS app, it, it can offset like a bad-ish GPA. Um, again, like I'm not saying those judgmentally. I just, you know, for some reason, I'm not the most eloquent tonight. So that's just the word that came out. But if you have a um, really strong GPA that can, you know, uh, offset a um, bad GAMSAT score or like a decent or like average GAMSAT score, right? Another thing with applications is please don't try and game the system. Um, you know, there's so many people who kind of go into it very like over calculating and say, oh, you know, this one decimal point will give me an extra shot at this uni that I want to go to. Um, and then they end up with a preference that they don't want, uh, an offer that they don't want, having to move when they don't want to. I've seen a lot of students do this um, against like solid advice. If there's this particular uni you want to go to, make that your number one, regardless of whether you have a shot at it or not, regardless of whether you think you have a shot at it. What you think and what you know, actually is reality is quite different when it comes to GAMSAT scores and stuff. So if you feel like I'm never going to get into like UWA, it's like two minutes down the road. It would be great if I got into it, but I'm never going to do it. It doesn't matter. Just put it up. If that's where you want to go, that's where you should put it. And start considering things like whether you're happy to go interstate, whether it's important for you to stay in a particular place because of friends and support systems and things like that. You know, all those things need to be considered. But my biggest piece of advice to you when it's, um, you know, good or like my biggest piece of advice when it comes to applications, please don't try and game GEMSAS because you will end up with like your fifth preference in a state that you don't want to be in and you know, just really unhappy. And I've seen it happen quite a fair bit. So whatever you want, apply to it first. Definitely. Um, also, I don't know, this will come up a little bit later, but it's worth saying now, um, make sure if you put down full, full fee that you understand what that involves. Um, this is important to keep in mind because say, for example, if you Melbourne is your top preference, if you put down full fee for Melbourne, then and say Deakin is your second preference. If Melbourne is willing to offer you a full fee, but so is Deakin, no, but Deakin is willing to offer you say a CSP, the fact that you put Melbourne at the top and put them down as a full fee means that they will, you will get that offer instead and you can't bypass it. So just keep that in mind. It, it does, it's annoying, I agree, you know, because obviously I assume most people would be like, oh, well, I'd rather CSPs and worst case scenario, give me a full fee, but you can't do that in the system the only thing you can do in the system is put down the universities. So keep that in mind, because that's another thing I've seen where people go, mm. oh, I put Melbourne full fee thinking, you know, just trying to increase my chances. Um, and then realizing I probably could have gotten a CSP somewhere else that I would have been happy to go to. But now I only get that full fee and I rejected it. And now I won't get any other offers for this year. So try not to be that person. Yeah. And make sure you understand the implications of a full fee spot as well. Uh, for like, if you're eligible for HEX, more, you can put full fee spots on HEX for up until your HEX runs out, then you have to pay up um, the remainder out of your own pocket. If you're not eligible for HEX, you know, kind of consider that as well. So if you are putting full fee uh, places or bonded places down, uh, make sure you understand the weight of what that is, because once you are in, when it comes to a bonded place or a full fee place, um, it, the only way you get out of it is if you just give up your spot. So just please make sure you consider your options before you put them in um, and don't do it just for chances when you have no way of keeping up that promise later. So uh, Ella, I think this might answer your question. Um, if you want to just take a screenshot, that's fine. We'll have the recording up as well. But in terms of calculating your GAMSAT score, right, uh, what we mean by weighted and unweighted, for those of you who don't know, is the way they calculate, roughly the way they calculate GAMSAT is they take your section one, section two, section three score, they double your section three score, and then they divide it by four, right? Not every uni will follow that. Let's look at Uni Mel, University of Queensland, Notre Dame, and um, Sydney, I'm going to leave to the side, right? Unweighted means they don't consider your section three as twice. So when they calculate your score, they'll look at your score and they go section one, section two, section three, plus them together. 
the result divided by three, not four, right? The other unis, Deakin, Griffith, UWA, ANU, Wollongong, Macquarie, uh, which is a private uni, which is a full fee uni, Flinders, they all take uh, weighted scores. The way USID does it just really quickly is they take your individual section, they basically just rank people according to that, and they give out offers to the top, like, uh, 100 to 300 people. That's pretty much how USID works, right? And to offset the fact that they don't do interviews anymore, they take people with very consistent scores across all three sections, because in their mind, that somehow makes up for an interview. Um, and it sh like if you have a strong S1, S2 score, that also helps with USID. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just throw in yeah, uh, a little anecdotal, like two cents there. Um, so yeah, that's that's 100% right, Magna, with regard to USAID and the ranking system. Um, the only thing is that, yeah, we've seen USAID in the last year in particular have a very strong preference, not necessarily for, for, for consistent scores, but actually for performance in NS1 and S2, where like there were scores where, you know, S3 almost seemed to be slightly disregarded. Now that's not confirmed by the university, or anything like that. This is just anecdotal looking at, and I'm embarrassed to say, you know, kind of past results from Reddit and other sources. Um, but yeah, so, you know, if you did really well in S1 and S2 and S3 is what brought you down, then actually maybe, you know, you said might be a, a good option. Yeah. Um, the next thing as well is ordering your preferences, right? So like we said, please put down whatever you want first, then whatever you want second, whatever you want third, up until six. But this is just sort of a rough guide for you all to follow, right? Don't sit there calculating or over-calculating for days and nights on end. Oh, uh, Uni Melb has a gamma of 69.35. I calculated mine. Mine's 69.28. Okay, I'm not going to make Uni Melb my first preference because that's going to put me at a disadvantage. And I'm going to put, um, you know, UNDF, Fremantle, in, you know, Perth. And if that's what you get, that's where you have to go because you only get one offer from GEMSAS. You get your highest preference. So please don't, whatever you think you don't have a chance with, you're probably being really tough on yourself. If you genuinely don't, then don't do it. Like don't preference it. But yeah, don't try and game the system because we've seen people end up in very unhappy places when it comes to GEMSAS preferences. And this also goes for... Um if you're going to be sitting the gams at again next year or even this year in September and then in March and you apply next year, same story. When I was applying, I, you know how your scores don't come out until you submit the application, right? To medicine um, for the gams out of March. So Magna, for the gams out of March, you don't get your scores until you've applied already. No, I think like applications close at the end of May. So. Oh, so they changed it for this year. Oh, from my from my year two years ago, three years ago, and I applied. Oh yeah, you because you were with the COVID thing, and I did. Oh, okay. Yes, we had to apply blind, didn't we? Yes, and I just remember I was tossing up. I was like, well, my previous gams before that was very poor, and I didn't know how it, how I did in the March sitting, and I was kind of like tossing up. Do I put University of Melbourne first? At the time, I didn't know if I was if I would qualify for it because I didn't have my gams results. I was like, do I put, you know, University of Melbourne first or do I put a university that I think in my mind might be easier to get in, in my mind at least. And I made this decision to put University of Melbourne first because that's where I wanted to go. That's where I wanted to live in that area. And I'm so happy I did because then when I got my results back, I was like, okay, good. And even if they weren't good enough for Melbourne, I could have still been qualified for one of the other universities. But the point is that always put your first preference up on that list. Do not assume that I'm not good enough. Don't assume that, you know, this is not good enough for this union. It might be good enough for this one. Just don't make those assumptions. And also remember, if this table, for instance, says 2022 GAMS at average for University of Melbourne is um, 2021 GPA average is 6.71. That's an average, which means people who've gotten lower that have gotten in and people have gotten higher than that have gotten in. So just because you're sitting on a 6.6 .6 does not mean that you're not going to get in. It just means that that doesn't hit the average from the previous year. That's all it means. Just apply to the universities you want to go to, please. Yeah. Cool. Um, if you have sort of multiple GAMSATs, like because uh, some of our old scores are now eligible as well, because ASA has increased the currency of results up to four years, 
um, make sure that you know which GAMS that you want to apply with, right? Uh, if you have a GAMS that honestly go with your highest sitting, please. Even if it's one point higher, you might not feel like it's a lot, but that one point is the difference between you getting in um, uh, or not, right? So go with your highest. Um, and if you need any help as well, all these tables and things like that, they're all on the Fraser's website for you all to check out. And obviously you'll get the recording later. And just to answer a question, how was the data collated? So the data was collated based on um, some data we get from, who's that lady that always releases stuff really early? Lindell or something from UW Wollongong? Yeah. So she's a university representative and she's the most transparent medical admissions person out there so she she's very clear on data we got a lot of that from her but also the phrases cohort and the general cohort including our tutor so a lot of students who've sat the gam sat and gotten in we uh get the data from them also i will say some universities actually do tell you what the averages are uh, yeah i think some of them have it on the gams has guide this year as well on the guides and also like to applicants um they'll say like oh this was the average this year and stuff like that yeah. Um, so, yeah, just just kind of keep that in mind. That also informs it. Um, I also just, again, want to reiterate the fact that those scores previously were averages. Even if on both of them you were below, I guarantee you that there's a person that got in with scores a fair bit lower than those. So even if you're below on all, all accounts, don't count yourself out. No. Uh, going sort of like the other way, and I guess to more um, emotional waters in a sense is if you're considering a reset of the GAMSAT, obviously this is not a fun thing to consider. And, you know, it can seem like a really daunting uh, sort of step to take again, um, just academically and mentally as well. But um, I will say two things before I hand it off to my lovely team. Um, the first thing I will say is reflection. If you've been a Fraser student, you know, Alex and I and a lot of people kind of talk about reflection a fair bit and it doesn't stop when the GAMSAT stops. Usually, um, I don't know, this is just what my parents have kind of made me do throughout life as well. If I made a mistake, if I stumbled, if I fell, if I failed anything, the first point is, you know, they never really ask. I'm really lucky they don't ask, why did you fail? How did you not study hard enough? It's always what went wrong? What do you think went wrong? Do you think there's anything you could have done better, right? So the first thing you need to realize is what you're feeling is completely valid. It's okay to be disappointed. It's okay to just break your computer screen if that's what you kind of want to do, to be honest. Um, no one has the right to tell you that, you know, it's okay, just move on, do it again, whatever. No, um, it's okay to be sad, but you need to start reflecting. Um, you need to start thinking about, where did I go wrong and where did I go right in March, right? Because you must have done a lot of things well and probably a few things not as well. And the second thing I'll say as well is through that reflection, you get a new pathway, right? And what that is, is when you reflect very deeply about things like this, you realize that you're not starting from scratch. So if you're resitting, it can often feel like, great, let me buy every biology, chemistry and maths textbook from you know, high school. Let me start all over again. Let me learn how to read for section one, right? I don't know, something like that. Like you feel like it's monumental that you have to start again. Um, you're not starting from scratch. You're starting from a lot of experience. And, and that's, that's what reflection shows you, sorry. Excellent, and that, and that is exactly why we say that um, you know, you're not starting from scratch. And so this is just one gams that closer to you getting in next time. to you getting that good score next time? Because if you improved even a little bit or you learned something even a little bit, now that learning is done. You don't need to do it again. Next time around, you already know that stuff. It's going to help you perform even better. Also remember that if you are thinking, gosh, you know, I tried so hard, you know, I put on all the effort and I'm so disappointed in, you know, I'm so disappointed in the scores. It's perfectly okay to feel that way. The gamut is difficult. There are a variety of factors which could have led to you maybe not doing as well. But one of the main ones that I find is that it's just the heat and the pressure of build the buildup of getting to the GAMS. Okay, my GAMS, it's coming. I've done all of these things. I've done this, this, this. I've done well in my mocks. I've done all of this stuff. I should do well. You're on the day. All of that emotion, all of that panic, that pressure, it becomes a melting pot of 
being stressed, being unconfident, insecure, insecure, clouded mind. A lot of the times I see students in these situations go away, do other things, come back and do really well the next season. For some reason, for them, the course itself wasn't helpful on the first time, but all of the learnings over the course cemented and then led to them performing really well. They used everything to do well. Sometimes you just need those few months. Now, someone in the comments wrote, someone in the Q&A said, got my S2 and S3 scores in 60s. However, failed S1. Would you recommend any material to boost scores, especially S1? Also, would getting phrases package again would help? That comes down to reflection. It comes down to trying to understand why it is that you didn't do well in S1. Now, if you're scoring S2 and S3, if you're scoring the 60s, that means that you have a solid foundation. That means that the fact that we failed S1, it's a little bit, it's a, it poses a little bit of a curious situation for us. If you are the 60s for S2 and S3, it means that your baseline is quite solid. So something must have gone wrong in S1 that derailed your score. It's time to start thinking. Was I panicked on the day? Was I stressed out leading up to it? Was I too in my head on the day? Was I freaked out by the long technical texts? Once you figure out what it is that caused you to not do so well, and it's probably one of those extraneous circumstances, I highly doubt it's something to do with you. When you figure out what those extraneous circumstances are, that is when you can start to think about, do I need to do the course again? Do I need to reach additional material? Or do I just need to be in a particular frame of mind where I'm much more relaxed and calm for the next sitting? Maybe doing the course again, doing another phrases package is not what you need right now. Maybe you already have retained everything that you need to do well, but one of those extraneous circumstances got you down for S1. So I want you to think about that and reach out to your tutors, reach out to your mentors, because we're always willing to have a chat and discuss what might have gone wrong, because it could be one of those things. So reflection is really the key, just to harp on Magna's point. Um, maybe if I, I'm so sorry, Magna. No, no, I, no. Go you, for it. Go for it. You, you even it. have the hand up and everything, and I'm still cutting in. I'm so sorry because I'm. I'm just we, gonna have. To we're, used to, we're used to that, Kieran. Don't worry. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um. No. Um. I'm gonna have to jump off, everyone. I'm so sorry. Um. But I just wanted to say, you know, from the bottom of my heart, genuinely to all of you that, you know, actually to every single one of you, congratulations just for getting through this whole experience. If it worked out for you, I'm so happy. If it didn't, I'm there with you. Each one of us is. Um, the final thing that I'll say is, you know, this is good to have like a general conversation, but I know that, you know, maybe you want more specific advice to you. So what I'll throw in is we actually have, um, you can book in a chat with like myself or one of the other mentors here by just following this Calendly link. Um, and then you can actually sit down with somebody and have a chat about like, what should I be doing? What are my chances? That kind of stuff. So please feel free to book in a time, you know, with one of us um, and we can sit down and kind of talk about your particular situation. But again, you know, I just want to say congratulations to all of you for getting this done. Hopefully you can forget about the GAMSAT for a while now. Um, and if you need anything, you know, just send me an email. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you so, so much. Um, Meghna, Rahman, Alex, it's so good seeing you all. Um, and... Yeah, well, I hopefully we'll, we'll chat soon. And, you know, for those of you applying, which I hope is most of you, best of luck. You know, hopefully this is the year. Thanks, Karen. Right. See you, everyone. See ya. Cool. Um, just quickly, sort of like moving on as well. Um, it is it is a big mental game. I feel like most of the games that is a it's a mindset game, right? I don't think it's it's, it's as much as like a physical game, but mentally it can feel really tough to take even just the first step right I know for me the second third time I sat it just the thought of like opening up a class to listen to it or the thought of like going to my tutoring sessions you know I did phrases I did like Barry Low I did like some other online math stuff just to get better at math so I was like just the thought of opening my book to do that it was so demotivating and I would do everything um to not kind of start but it's just about really small uh, gains right and keep in mind it's about skills and there's very few skills that you will never go wrong doing over and over again and that's things like reading more like for section one not reading widely 
but reading things like poems and thinking about, oh, how would Asa use this in a STEM to try and like, you know, trick me? Or how would Asa use this in questions, right? Researching more for your section two, doing more maths for section three, right? Um, if you want any like really good textbook recommendations for maths that teach it to you very logically, just email me. I have like PDFs of them. I'm happy to send them out to people. They really help. They really, really do. But it's things like that you want to get started on not necessarily sitting down doing a mock exam every single day and think that will sort of help you. If you didn't do well, it's probably because you overdid a certain skill or you overthought your way and approaches to doing like certain stems or certain sections of the GAMSAT, right? So kind of correct that. Start with the basics, start with the fundamentals, and then your brain will start, to re start remembering what it did and it will start correcting itself. Absolutely. So I just wanted to reiterate um, what was mentioned before with regards to materials. I find that when it comes to performance-based things, the best material, like things that you have to do over a longer period of time that you have to reset, the best material is yourself, right? Um, if you're going to think about doing something and improving, the only way you can improve is to know what went wrong the first time, right? And the only way that you're going to do that is through reflection. So if you if you want to ensure that, so a lot of people say, oh, I sat, I spent $500 for the game set or whatever it is now. I spent that much money and I got a score that wasn't decent and I wasted that money and that money's gone now. Is it really gone or have you paid for the experience, right? And if you paid for the experience, are you really going to let that experience go to waste, right? We're thinking about positive gain here, right? You can gain from everything. So if you've paid the money and you didn't get the score that you wanted, think about why, 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 why. So my thing was, as soon as I sat the game set, I created this, this document where I was writing down how I felt, what were the major barriers to this game set. Just in case if I was going to sit it again, then I've got this document to, to fall back on. This is how I was initially feeling. And over time, this is what I think went wrong. This is how I'm going to improve in the future. So when you keep that kind of growth mindset, nothing you do is wasted. There's always progression from every experience. And it's that mindset that you need to take to continually kind of grow. And, and it's honestly the mindset you need in medicine as well. To be to, to be frank with you, um, that's how that those kind of people that are always self-reflective make the best doctors too. And this is this is probably the smallest rejection you'll face in your medical career. Sometimes your specialties that you want to get into, it could take you four or five years to get into a specialty. It could take you sometimes like five years to pass medicine, right? Instead of four years. Like this is it, on the scale of things that you will face as a doctor, as a medical professional. Um, to be honest with you, there were some days during Dent where I was like, crap, I wish I was doing the GAMSAT because the volume of what I needed to pass was just so much less preferential and preferable. So yeah, um, please don't let it get you down to that level because there's, there's a lot in front of you. So you need that mental resilience if this is the career and field that you really want to follow for the rest of your life. So just wrapping up, um, some key dates, please don't forget. If you are going to book for the GAMSAT, registrations are open now, I think. I hate how ASA does that. I really do. I hate how they subtly open like September um, registrations, but they won't give you like the May results until they feel like it. So I don't know. It's very sneaky of them. Um, it's very money grabby. Um, so registrations are open. They do close on the 21st of July, but that's the late registration, which is I don't know, another $75 more. So you end up paying almost $600. So please make sure you register on time if you do want to do want to sit it. Um, so GAMSAT registrations are open. The GAMSAT exam will be between the 8th and 12th of September and the results are released mid to November. So you can bet on it being like Friday, 4.59 p.m. in one random day of November. So those are all the dates for those who are considering um, resets. So, I think we've talked about sort of all of these. Think about how much time and effort you can invest and not to sort of be demotivating as well, but I do understand everyone, you know, at some point wants to try the GAMSA. I know most of my biomed cohort did. Um, even without wanting to get into med or wanting to do med, it was just make sure that this is actually what you want to do as well. That's a really big consideration because sometimes the going gets really tough for a lot of us. Um, to get in. It takes years, right? Um, so make sure that this is something that you feel like is worthy for you and is something that you really, really want to do. And 
make sure you create a study plan this time around. It's not the quantity, it's the quality when it comes to the GAMSAT. You can do two hours of study and do better than someone who spent 25 hours a week studying. So please make sure that it's about the quality um, of what you're doing. And also, none of us are salespeople, so this is not a sales pitch in any way, but oftentimes it's not the best solution to go back and do the exact same course again or anything like that. Um, if you're a previous, previous Fraser student, a lot of the times you can do custom packages, right? So my second time, I did like a custom package where I bought a lot of private tutorials, mainly for section three, um, and I bought mock exams. So that was pretty much where I felt like I needed the value because I barely did anything for the mocks. Like, I think I went to two mock exams. That's it. Um, I was really nervous to go in. I didn't want to sit there. And this was when it was a paper exam, guys. So I was doing like 110 questions, 180 questions in section three. It was horrid. And I didn't want to do that as a mock exam at Fraser's in the old office that we used to have when I was a student. So um, it was really daunting. So I just didn't make the most of that experience. And I thought, you know what, maybe this will help me to get prepared for exam day. So please don't think that, you know, um, you kind of need to go back in and spend like thousands and thousands of dollars. We're more than happy, well, Kieran and, you know, other like student support offices, we're more than happy to, um, you know, like help you find the right package or if there's something else you want to do, make sure you do your research and see the value of it before you commit to it as well. If you only used four out of 12 private shoots, uh, can we obtain them from phrases again? I'm really sorry. No, once you lose the private shoots, you lose them. That's why we kind of, fought. we yell at you guys every week to make you book it in um, because logistically it's an absolute nightmare to do like carryover shoots and things like that. So I'm really sorry. Um, how do you book a personalized package? Kieran's email is right at the end of this and please email him or you can even go on our website and there's a little chat box thing and you can just say, hey, previous student at Fraser's, I want to do a custom package. Can someone talk to me about what my needs might be, right? And you can talk to us and we can help you kind of see like, hey, maybe only the mocks will be a good idea for you or something like that. So, yeah. Cool. Um, We'll be here. You can ask us any questions. The only reason I'm is just so you guys have our emails, I'm going to put it up here. But I know we went really over time, but hopefully all of you found this very helpful. Um, but yeah, please like shoot us any and all questions um, that you might have in the upcoming days. I know I'm talking to a couple of you over the next few days. I can see like your names on the participant list. So I'm very, I'm very keen to. But yeah, any of you who might need any help. Um, Oh, Kieran's link doesn't work. What link? Um, his email is just on the screen. I'm not sure what you mean by link. Is that the Calendly thing? Oh, yeah, look, I haven't used Calendly in like a year, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just our emails are there. But yeah, please go for it. any and all questions. Any thoughts, Rahman, Alex, you want to share with them as final pearls of wisdom as well, please? Yeah, one one thought. Um, yeah. Please don't beat yourself up if you feel like you wasted a year not getting into medical school. The one thing that I've realized starting medical school is that you start at the bottom of the barrel, okay? You are you are so bottom, it's crazy, right? Like, And then you start going, you start progressing through your career. And then if you speak to a fellow, or sorry, if you speak, I won't say fellow, but if you speak to like a HMO or an intern, even if you speak to an unaccredited registrar, they still feel like they're at the bottom of the barrel. Because the journey in medicine is just so long that a year, a year here and there, even if you need to take like a gap year, doesn't make that much of a difference to your entire um, medical career. It might take you like 15 years to specialize in whatever specialty you're going to get to. Just to become a general practitioner, I think, is a minimum of nine years since you start med school. So just goes to show that the journey is arduous. The journey is long. Um, a couple of years here and there doesn't actually matter in the, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I'm on a gap year right now. Um, yeah, so... Uh, not all of dentistry went according to plan in my first year. I just felt like mentally, physically, I needed a break. So I took it. I'm back home in Melbourne. I've been super lazy. I haven't really started doing stuff in my gap year yet, but I will. Um, so yeah, like, please like take the break. And time is 
just that. It's just time. You Don't worry about your age either. You're going to be 30. You're going to be 35. Might as well be a doctor at that age. So please don't sort of let that be another thing to stand in your way or another hurdle. And if you're like, let's say you're 28 and, you know, you are still, it's still going to take another year or so to get into medicine. When you're 60 years old and you are associate professor of, I don't know, um, general surgery, who's, you know, operating and doing all the fun stuff in general surgery at 60 years old, you're not going to be like, oh gosh, when I was 28, I had to wait until I was 29 to get in. You're going to be like, I'm 60 years old. I'm super successful. That one or two years did not matter in the grand scheme of things at all. And I know that, I know that, you know, you might have family who might be saying, oh, you know, now it's an extra year. Please don't listen to people who don't really understand what you've gone through. Just explain, look, this is my timeline. I'm getting there. It's going to be fine. Yeah. And just Angela as well, like just writing in the chat, you know, I'm, I'm 29, age is a factor. Um, I'm turning 27 next week. So, and I was, I'm kind of fine, like taking that gap. Yeah. And I was in the exact same boat. I'm just like, it took so long to get in. I've just added another year to my graduating time almost. I'll be like 30. What what the hell am I doing? But it it's, yeah, it's just, it's a year at the end of the day. Um, in the grand scheme of things, like Alex said, trust me, you're not going to be thinking about this when you're in med. And tr- honestly, you will forget about this three weeks into med. Trust me on this. Like, yeah. this is not the stuff any of you will have time to think about. Your time to think about things you'll think about is when can I eat a proper meal? When can I just relax a bit? And when can I not listen to a lecture? So none of this stuff, you're going to, you're not going to be thinking about it. Okay. So don't. Oh my God, that proper meal just hit me like deep. Yeah. <laughs> oh my oh, God. Oh, the grind is real. Yeah. <laughs> One time I was eating sushi in the corner of a lecture hall and the like professor or the doctor remembered. So the next day at placement, he straight up calls me out and goes, Oh yeah, the sushi girl, right? <laughs> He's like, I always see you just eating in the corner. And I'm like, I have 12 minutes to eat before I have to like run to another lecture. So yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Embarrassing. Um, I think we might leave it there if no more questions are coming through. Um, hopefully this has helped everyone. Um, and as you know, you probably have our emails as well. And if there's anything we can do for you, please always feel free to let us know because we've all been here. It's it's not an easy thing to get through. Um, and applications themselves aren't easy either. So you can ask us on, you know, either of those things and we'll help you. Cool. All right. All right. Have a great night, uh, everyone. And I'll see you all soon, hopefully. Okay. Good luck. Thanks, Meg. Good seeing both of you guys. Have a great night. You too. Bye.